Hi, everyone. Welcome. Natalie LaBarber here. I am thrilled to give a quick little intro here for our guest speaker, Michael Reese. Um, <clears throat> Michael currently serves as a renewable hydrogen and ammonia research lead and heads the University of Minnesota West Central Research and Outreach Center, also known as WCROC, as a director of operations. Um, the WCROC is an 1,100-acre agricultural experiment station located in western Minnesota near the community of Morris that focuses on crop, dairy, swine, horticulture, and renewable energy research. Uh, for over 23 years, Michael set the strategic direction and oversaw the development of the renewable energy program at WCROC. He has participated as principal investigator on over $30 million of research and demonstration projects, including wind energy, biomass gasification, renewable hydrogen and pneumonia, and solar energy systems. He led the Renewable Energy Program strategy to reduce fossil energy consumption and agriculture production systems through incorporating renewable and efficient energy technologies. Um, <clears throat> And in 2013, Michael led the development, commissioning, and operation of the first in the world wind to ammonia pilot plant. The ammonia is used for nitrogen fertilizer, but also as an effective hydrogen carrier. And to that end, Michael has participated in several hydrogen ammonia fuel projects, uh, primarily revolving around agriculture applications. Um, and these experiences have provided a unique perspective on the production utilization of green hydrogen and ammonia, as well as the development of several key relationships. Um, his qualifications include a mix of academic, research, business experiences, and he has been invited speaker for numerous national and regional conferences on the topic of renewable energy. So it is without further ado that we welcome Michael Reese to our presentation. So thank you, Michael, so much for joining us. Yes, thank you very much, Natalie. Appreciate that uh, introduction uh, and the invitation to speak with all of you this evening. So the title of my presentation tonight is Green Hydrogen and Pneumonia implications for Minnesota and beyond. So uh, first, I want to acknowledge a few of our funding organizations. Uh, the state of Minnesota is especially important because they have provided quite a bit of the uh, initial funding and, and uh, more than that, uh, seed funding and, and funding to uh, build capital projects and test these systems. So, and then also the United States Department of Energy ARPA E refill program, uh, which we received funding from initially back in about 2018. And they're funding a large demonstration project that we're uh, currently developing. Our program goal is to reduce fossil energy consumption and production in agriculture. As you are probably aware, agriculture is a difficult uh, industry to decarbonize. Uh, there's a Lot, quite a few independent farmers and a lot of diversity within the industry. Uh, so there's no real clear path uh, to do uh, just uh, broad scale uh, brush stroke type uh, efforts. It's really gets down into uh, doing a lot of good things or a lot of things uh, well uh, to, to equal a sum total of, of progress. So 20 to 25% of the world's and Minnesota's greenhouse gas emissions are attributed to agriculture, forestry and related industries. 2% uh, of the global greenhouse gas emissions are attributed to ammonia and nitrogen fertilizer production. So very significant there. And then markets and policies are trending toward the need for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in production and agriculture. Our, my, my talk tonight is on green hydrogen and ammonia, but we work in several areas as I already mentioned. Uh, including livestock production and making that more energy efficient and also incorporating uh, renewable energy, such as I'll point out one uh, up in the upper right corner, uh, using solar panels for not only producing electricity, but for using them as shade, uh, which is a area called agrivoltaics, a uh, rapidly sp expanding area, by the way. We've had some national and regional recognition for our work. Uh, Washington Post, and this is uh, last fall, about a year ago, and also the Star Tribune uh, ran stories about this, this particular uh, technology that I and innovation that I mentioned using solar for multiple applications. And then uh, New York Times, uh, on July 1st, 2022, prior to when the IRA was, was uh, passed, they did a story on the Morris model a uh, effort that we're working with 
looking at communities and how uh, communities can, can take on the role of leading in climate climate action. So uh, decarbonizing the Midwest using zero carbon hydrogen. Um, if you look at you know, hydrogen in, in, as a whole, uh, and we've been working on this, we as in the country has been working on this for decades now. And 10, 20 years ago, uh, the big buzz was that we were gonna use green hydrogen for our cars. And that didn't really come to fruition for a number of reasons. One was the technology wasn't quite ready, uh, but then the fueling was challenging. Uh, and it really came down to that hydrogen is very expensive to store and transport. And so when you're looking at what makes sense, agriculture actually is, is com comes to mind very quickly. And the reason for that is when you look at uh, our nitrogen fertilizer use, uh, we use about a billion dollars worth of nitrogen fertilizer in Minnesota annually. And currently our nitrogen fertilizer is made using natural gas and coal as the, the seed stock, feed stock for it. So in that process, we use uh, steam methane reforming of natural gas uh, and basically cleave off the carbon and use the hydrogen, pull nitrogen from the air, and then put them together under high pressure and high temperature. And uh, in doing so, we need to really scrub the hydrogen uh, well, and uh, that takes a lot of expensive equipment. And so these plants have become what's called world scale. There's only about 200 worldwide. And we use, they use some of the CO2 then to combine with ammonia to produce urea fertilizer, which is granular and can store easy. Uh, but but uh, primarily uh, ammonia is produced. Um, there has been considerable interest in using ammonia for fueling, grain drying, tractors and other trucks. And I, I'll, I'll get into the reasons why uh, in, in a little bit. Another opportunity is using hydro, both hydrogen and ammonia and power for power generation and thermal energy. You can use, uh, use it to fuel gas turbines, uh, engine gen sets, burgers and boilers. That's one of the nice things about both is that they're fairly flexible. Uh, biofuel production, this is primarily uh, green hydrogen, but uh, we can use green hydrogen when combined with CO2 to produce renewable diesel fuel, jet fuel, also known as SAF or sustainable aviation fuel, e-methanol and ethanol. Uh, we don't, we actually don't need corn to produce ethanol. We can just capture CO2, combine it with uh, hydrogen to produce ethanol. The challenge with that now is, is that it's not quite economical yet, but the technology is moving very quickly towards this. And if we do uh, utilize the CO2 from fermentation, uh, to produce these fuels, that, that CO2 is very pure. It's 96 to 98% pure. So it doesn't require, if you recall, I mentioned scrubbing the CO2 uh, uh, from uh, the hydrogen. It, it's uh, uh, This process doesn't require such a large scale. Then moving on to number four, the medium heavy, trans heavy, heavy transportation industry. Uh, we could switch uh, to hydrogen and ammonia for fueling trucks, mining equipment, tractors, strange engines, and ships. Um, by the way, uh, Toyota has been very keen on using ammonia in cars. Um, and uh, there are obviously also still some uh, interest in using hydrogen in cars. I think that's still going to be challenging, especially on the ammonia side, because of some of the uh, potential hazards for ammonia yet. Uh, but there are... As, as I said, Toyota and other large uh, companies are working towards that or in that direction. Mining and steel making, we could displace energy used in the processing of ore into iron pellets uh, by using hydrogen, and then we could use it hydrogen or and or ammonia in the carbon purification process with steel making. And this is currently responsible for about 8% of global, global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and it also has a very interesting connection to Minnesota, uh, we obviously uh, have a fairly robust iron ore industry, mining industry, and much of that iron is, you know, basically isn't, it goes unprocessed. Uh, we send out iron, iron ore pellets, uh, and this might be an opportunity to actually make green steel or green iron here in Minnesota. 
And then finally, uh, construction. And when we're talking about construction here, we're primarily talking about concrete. The production of concrete involves heating uh, a limestone. And when, when you hit heat limestone up, you, you drive the CO2 off. And then you capture, then you're, you, you basically are produced quicklime, which is used to make concrete. Uh, so in that process, you're obviously you're using natural gas or some other form of energy to in a kiln to heat up the limestone. So that's creating CO2, and then you're driving the CO2 off. So you have a double uh, a double problem there. And in that that case, construction is estimated to be about six percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. And this is an area that uh, Bill Gates talks of frequently, uh, trying to resolve that issue. So you add those up and you know, we see that hydrogen could play a key role in, in decarbonizing industry in Minnesota and the Midwest. Just another depiction of this. Uh, I think the latter is, I think they have it flipped around though. I think fertilizer should be down at the bottom rung because it's, it, you would start there, but this is their depiction. So fertilizer would be uh, the first place where you'd start and that would enable some of the other technologies. And this one important part of this is that once you start one, uh, there's this, there's a idea called sector coupling that uh, once you have the industry started for green ammonia or green hydrogen and or green ammonia, then there, it becomes easier to uh, participate or these other industries to participate in that and source green hydrogen. And so it's, it's kind of builds upon each other. Back to agriculture though, uh, if you look at the process we take wind energy or solar or both. Actually, both is is uh, in many cases ideal. Uh, you produce hydrogen by electrolyzing water. You pull nitrogen from the air. You combine them in a in a reactor uh, in a Haber Bosch process to produce ammonia. And then you can use the hydrogen also to produce the advanced fuels I talked about. On the ammonia side, you which is NH three, you could produce nitrogen fertilizer which ammonia is, but you could also produce other nitrogen fertilizers. You could use the ammonia for tractor fuel, truck fuel, irrigation generators, backup generators, and grain drying. If you look at the Midwest uh, in central part of the U.S. on the left side of the panel, I'm just going to check audio right now is just to make sure we, are we still good? That, uh, yep, still good. Okay, good. You see that through the center part of the U.S., we have some of the highest wind resource in the world. Uh, then you look on the right panel, the green, dark green uh, squares are the high corn producing uh, counties, just as an as example, and where, where green ammonia is used. Uh, and if you look at it, it's kind of in the shape of a upside down W or U. That's basically the corn belt. And so I don't, I think uh, this is a very unique situation worldwide where you have this good of, you know, uh, quality of wind resource and solar for that matter. Uh, in close proximity to very high demand for nit nitrogen fertilizer. And uh, we could basically uh, add 30% more wind capacity if we produced all the nitrogen fertilizer uh, that we need from wind energy. We could, we could add 30% more wind energy in the U.S. And in addition to being able to add the wind energy, uh, we overcome an issue called stranded wind and solar where uh, in the Dakotas, for example, we don't have the transmission capacity to move the power uh, to load centers like Minneapolis, Chicago, Detroit. Uh, so we could actually produce the nitrogen fertilizer in these areas and then transport that to various locations. So why renewable ammonia? Uh, the bigger one shows uh, what's happening currently and over the last approximately 20, or 15 years, uh, the if you can see colors, the blue line is the natural gas price, extremely volatile. The orange line is the corn price, uh, which only makes sense that's here if you look at the anhydrous ammonia price. Recall I say, said that anhydrous ammonia is made from natural gas. Uh, if you look in the 2011 to 2012 timeframe, you can see natural gas is extremely low. 
but in hydrous ammonia is is uh, about nine hundred dollars a ton, and so it's not following natural gas; it's actually following corn price. And so this is this is challenging for farmers because uh, they uh, have a hard time budgeting for nitrogen fertilizer inputs, and they can't then therefore they can't market their grain because they don't know what the price is going to be for their inputs, and so that. Uh, and then also there seems to be some price gouging going on when corn is high, fertilizer prices track up. So that's one reason is to create a uh, stable system that's consistent on an annual basis with a stable price. The second reason is to reduce the carbon intensity again. And, and uh, now the third reason and very good reason is that there's a IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, hydrogen production credit of $3 per kilogram that will greatly influence uh, the economics of this. So I just want to go quickly through this again. Uh, this is, I think green ammonia is an elegant solution. Uh, we can use the wind energy uh, that's in on farmer's land uh, to nourish the crops that are right below the wind farm. And so you can take wind energy, water and air to produce nitrogen fertilizer, use a electrolysis uh, to separate water uh, you pull nitrogen from the air, air is 78% nitrogen. You cleave off the oxygen and argon that are uh, also in the air to get pure nitrogen. That's a very uh, robust and uh, long-term uh, technology. Uh, you put them together in a Haber-Bosch process. Haber-Bosch, by the way, is, is a process that was developed in 19, 1910s, 1910s. Uh, by Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch. Uh, they both won the Nobel Prize for it, for that innovation. And it's it's generally accepted as one of the top five innovations of all time. Without, without it, uh, half, half the world's population would starve. So a very significant uh, innovation to produce synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. And it's still used today after you know, over a hundred years of, of use. Uh, I also have a fourth step here. This is the production of urea. And I think for Minnesota in the Midwest, this makes quite a bit of sense because you can uh, take anhydrous ammonia, which is a gas. Uh, it's, it's actually a liquid in storage when it's released in the atmosphere, it's a gas. Uh, but uh, the storage of it takes pressurized tanks and it's, there, it's, it's still costly to uh, store. If we're gonna produce it year round here in the Midwest, we need to have storage or we can produce urea. And so that process is capture CO2 from like an ethanol plant or some other source and, and uh, combine it with the ammonia. And then you have a granular product uh, that you can utilize and store uh, in uh, safer. And there's a lot of other benefits to it as well. So next, next generation ammonia production from wind and solar, we have a project with uh, Research Triangle Institute where we're going to install a one metric ton per day uh, green ammonia plants. As mentioned in uh, earlier, we did, or we do have a green ammonia pilot plant. There's the first in the world. Uh, we're dismantling that now in preparation for this project, which is uh, just uh, getting underway. So this is a project with Nell, which is a electrolyzer company, Kasali, which is a hundred year old ammonia technology engineering company, uh, Research Triangle Institute in North Carolina is leading, as I mentioned, GE Research uh, is participating along with Minnesota Utilities, Excel Energy, Great River Energy, Ottertail Power. Uh, Nutrien is a fertilizer company that's participating. Minnesota uh, entity AURI is, is involved. And then Shell is interested from a uh, ammonia energy or ammonia fuel uh, standpoint. So what are we going to do with the ammonia? Well, you know, we're, we're going to use it for fertilizer, but we're also going to use it for power. We have a direct ammonia fuel cell that we'll be testing here. Uh, that's that's an ideal technology. And it also could be an idealistic technology because uh, it's hard to scale those systems up. But uh, you the results of running ammonia through a fuel cell like this is our heat, or the products, I should say, our heat uh, into or diatomic nitrogen, so you're just putting it back in the air, and electricity. So from that standpoint, there are no emissions. I should say, and water, by the way. Um, 
from a fuel side, we're going to use the ammonia. We're going to crack it on board a forklift and uh, use a hydrogen fuel cell for that. And then uh, in addition to fertilizer, we have some other projects uh, that are funded outside of, of refuel. We're, we are developing a portable engine gen set, what we call non-wire solutions. Uh, so in rural areas, uh, we're seeing a lot of developments around in disruptive technologies in the area. So I'll give you a couple examples. First, a farm uses uh, significant amounts of energy, electricity in the fall during harvest, but uh, a, a rural utility will, may not want to build out a million dollars with the transmission or distribution line to service that. So one idea is that they, during this time frame, they'll will place an ammonia, green ammonia genset near this farm to supply that power and then move it around uh, to other applications. Another application is that, for example, in near Alexandria, there's a lot of lakes and uh, it's disruptive for a rural utility like Roomstone Electric for uh, people coming to their cabin because they don't know when they're going to come. Uh, sometimes the weather's nice, sometimes it's not. Uh, but people come and then they turn the air conditioning on and they don't respond well to, to demand side management. So they don't respond well to price signals. So if it's a high price, they want it anyway. So that means the utility usually has to build out enough to, to supply that power. Now it's even a compounded problem because people are driving their uh, electric vehicles to the lake. In fact, when I came to the office tonight, uh, there was a Rivian parked in our fast charger. Uh, they were on their way from Sioux Falls to Lake Minnewaska to their cabin, and uh, they needed to stop and charge uh, because the wind was so so great they they didn't quite couldn't quite make it. So that's just a you know, an example that uh, was was I ran into tonight. Uh, the other area is, is grain drying. I'll talk a little bit more about that, and then a herbicide duck burner. So uh, at Excel Energy and other gas turbine facilities, uh, they have a heat recovery system on the back. And that heat they use to run a, a pressure a steam turbine. Uh, they can actually add natural gas to that to run the steam turbine more often. And so we're taking one of those natural gas burners out in, in testing ammonia, green ammonia in it. And then also we're we've tested an ammonia fuel tracker. This all sounds great, but at the end of the day, it comes down to price. And uh, so are my colleagues Matt Palace and Dr. Matt Pallas and, and Professor Perdomo Statides in the Chemical Engineering Department at Minneapolis campus. They did a techno-economic assessment for producing green ammonia in three counties in Minnesota. And in Stevens County, where I'm sitting today, it, they came up with a price of $572 per metric ton. Uh, in Nobles, $542. In Dakota, $620. Now that may not mean much to you what it, if you to, were to look back at uh, the average price of ammonia that I showed you earlier, it's actually about $550 retail price. So we're a little higher yet. Uh, but the IRA hydrogen production tax credit provides a tax rate of $529 per metric ton over a 10-year period of time. And so <clears throat> instead of $572 for Stevens County, you're down to around $50. And uh, this is a little uh, not, not how it would probably work out because the tax credits are only good for 10 years. And if you build, you would be able to build for 20 or 30 years. And so uh, in other analysis, we've actually levelized those costs over 10 and 20 years. And the price still is though is about $300 per metric ton, which I'll show you here right now. So uh, if you look at the black line, this is the historic ammonia prices, the blue line. Is what the technology can do today without any incentives. The green line is in 10 years. The dotted blue line is today with the production tax credits levelized over 20 years. So $300 rate. And then the dotted green line, sorry if you're colorblind, but that's uh, what we expect in 2030. So I think the message here is that you know, we've been working on technology to make this more efficient at a smaller scale or regional scale. So uh, we can start producing ammonia and, and nitrogen fertilizer here in Minnesota in the Midwest, but the IRA tax credit is what really pushed it over the, the edge. And now I'm saying that this is gonna happen. There will be companies doing this. 
There's several projects that already have been announced. Uh, you might hear some interesting things tomorrow with the with the uh, hydrogen hub announcements in Philadelphia. Uh, but one one thing that concerns me is that uh, our our farmers going to be able to participate and our co-ops going to be able to participate. And so that's something that we've been advocating for and trying to help is let's let's uh, make sure that our farmers and our cooperatives can take advantage of this opportunity as well. We, we still want and need the large fertilizer companies to to uh, play a role here, but uh, we'd certainly like to see some of the benefits uh, go to our farmers, our co-ops and our communities of this higher, of this tax incentive. So if you look at Minnesota's use of nitrogen fertilizer over time, the blue line, the top line is urea. Urea has, has been increasing in use. And the next line down, the green line is anhydrous ammonia and anhydrous has been de decreasing in use. And there's some reasons for that. Anhydrous is, a, in, has a, in, is an inhalation hazard. Uh, it's water uh, philic. So if you were to have an ammonia release, it would burn your, your skin, burn your eyes. Uh, and so that's a concern for cooperatives from a liability standpoint. It's also uh, highly regulated. Uh, farmers have used it for decades now. And so it's quite common in, in Minnesota, but at the same time, uh, rails don't like to carry it as much and, and things like that. So uh, we've been moving a little bit away from anhydrous ammonia, even though it is a cheaper product. And that's why it's still, uh, you know, still holding fairly strong uh, overall in the mix. So urea, uh, urea is a granular. Uh, it's, uh, can be stored locally in sheds, like you see in the in one of the panes here. It can be, and then it's spread onto the fields, uh, carried out to the field with the with the truck, like you see in the upper right, and then spread with either a trailer or a big three wheeler uh, on fields. It goes on fast. Uh, it stays fairly well in the, in the soil, and uh, so it has a lot of good properties. And I mentioned we can store it locally. We have very large storage facilities that are cooperatives for urea. So there's some advantages to go to from green ammonia to green urea. I'm gonna change gears a little bit. Uh, we uh, have done quite a bit of energy auditing of our cropping systems and livestock systems at the West Central Research and Outreach Center. My colleague, Joel Tullickson developed this graph. It's a pie chart that shows the fossil energy footprint of corn production at our facility. And if you look at uh, the black piece of that pie is 36%, that's the nitrogen fertilizer fossil energy footprint for corn. The uh, turquoise color, I'm gonna say, is uh, 42% and that's grain drying. So between grain drying and nitrogen fertilizer, we have uh, 80, about 80% 80 of the fossil energy footprint. And then you could throw in tractors at about 13 to 14, tractors and trucks. Uh, so uh, we can actually use green ammonia for all three of those. And so there's a there's a pretty clear path towards reducing fossil energy consumption production in corn and corn production. Uh, it's you know over 90%, which I believe is transformative. For fertilizer, it's a drop-in replacement. It's the same product. Uh, when you're talking about replacing natural gas and propane, it's a little, there's a little more challenge to that. Uh, but if you look at NH3, it's not too much different than methane, which is CH4. And we have we, we have three hydrogen uh, atoms in, in, in ammonia and four in methane. Uh, and if you're just going to produce green hydrogen, uh, there's issues because it's very expensive to store and transport ammonia. Above ground ammonia storage is 10 times less costly than hydrogen. Below ground hydrogen storage is uh, 10 times more costly than ammonia as well. So either way you go, ammonia is better than, than hydrogen. Um, what, what I should, should mention, there are some other benefits. There's benefits that there's no CO2 or CO, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide emissions, no particulates. I'll get around to the NOx and NTO emissions, which is an important factor. So my colleagues also did a study looking at islanding or a microgrid. This isn't really a microgrid, it's for it's a grid for the city. Uh, cities using all in the island and renewable energy system. 
Uh, they did, they analyzed uh, several cities, about 15, I believe. Now it's up to 2024. Uh, this paper here, by the way, won the best paper of the year award for computational chemical engineering back in 2020. So very significant work. And what they found was when they developed this model of using 100% renewable energy system and, and adding in storage is that uh, if they were to allow the model to pick wind and solar and hydrogen, battery, ammonia, uh, they found that in, uh, in all cases, ammonia was better than hydrogen. Um, hydrogen's the blue, I, sh I should say in almost all cases. Uh, and then uh, ammonia is the green. They found that most, most of all that ammonia beat out hydrogen. But then when you combined hydrogen and ammonia, they found that that was the clear winner. And that's, that hybrid system uh, made sense when, when we analyzed it because uh, um, hydrogen gives the lowest cost uh, because it's most efficient if you use it uh, in a short term, like eight hours or 24 hours. But if you're going to store for any period of time, you should convert it to ammonia. And that's that's what the model selected, by the way. So uh, you might ask, well, where, where do batteries rate? For long-term storage, they didn't rank very high. Or they rank very high, I should say. They were very expensive. And uh, hydrogen, hydrogen or ammonia, or both of them, is, is considerably better than storing uh, electricity with batteries for a long period of time. Going into the ammonia burner studies, they're using ammonia for thermal energy or combusting it for ap other applications. Um, you can see that these, these flames, by the way, are ammonia flames. Uh, the one in the center, uh, your right, if you look closely, you can see some swirls. And that's some technology that the University of Minnesota has developed. Uh, it, it, we found that colleagues in mechanical engineering, Will, Professor Will Northrup and his students have found that if you swirl the flames, uh, the ammonia stays in, in uh, the combustion area longer. And so you have a more complete burn. And that's really important because in doing so, you lower the NOx uh, you, uh, and you, you do not have as much ammonia ex escape and uh, then, so then we only have the N2O emissions to really uh, be concerned with. We tested this, uh, these uh, nozzles, I should say, in a grain dryer back in uh, about a year ago, and it worked very well. Um, you might notice that ammonia burns orange. It's not because it's, it's a lower temperature or it's incomplete combustion. It's just the way that it, it looks. It's, it doesn't have particulates in it like, like uh, methane or natural gas or propane does, and, but it's still the same temperature. And so we did this test, uh, worked out great. And uh, now we're moving into systems. This, this was a mix of both hydrogen and ammonia. Uh, there's technology where you can crack a little bit of a hydrogen and run it into the system. Uh, we just use pure hydrogen in this case for this test. Uh, but the next systems and kind of really novel innovation is using 100% ammonia uh, for these systems, both for combustion systems and engines. And that's where uh, the mechanical engineering departments in Minneapolis campus really shines. This is a, a tractor that we uh, tested running on 50% ammonia and 50% diesel fuel. And again, uh, the next stage is going to have 100% green ammonia. Uh, there are other companies that are working in this space. Amaji uh, is one out of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, it's a startup. They have a technology where they crack ammonia on board and use it in a hydrogen fuel cell. They've installed it in a John Deere tractor as well as a semi. And now they're working on a, uh, ships. So going, going in this direction. I, I like this uh, vision that Tyson Krupp has put together. Uh, and it's similar to what I've been talking about. So we start with green hydrogen. Uh, we produce fertilizer for green ammonia. Uh, we can use then that also then for fuel. We can use hydrogen for methanol production for synthetic fuels. And uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen is basically at the core of all these uh, industry and transportation uh, energy and processes. So lot, there's been a lot of talk recently also about sustainable aviation fuel. 
Uh, we'd like to point out just in, there's these are four routes that you use in, in producing sustainable aviation fuel, but in all of them, we use uh, hydrogen. So we need to produce hydrogen in order to do this. And so we still don't get around uh, not producing hydrogen uh, when we go to sustainable aviation fuel. So uh, the take home messages tonight are that uh, the Inflation Reduction Act has dramatically changed the landscape. Uh, $3 a kilogram in hydrogen production incentive uh, with the direct pay option, meaning that you don't really need a passive income to use them anymore has changed the playing field and we're gonna see this happen. It's, it just has to happen because the incentive is that good. We're working to improve the technology, make it more efficient. However, uh, they're commercially ready for deployment now with the Midwest when you consider the, the hydrogen production center. So I think, again, the question is, how does Midwest best position itself to take advantage of this opportunity? I'd like to see as much of this happen uh, with Minnesota companies, Minnesota farmers, Minnesota citizens, let's try to keep more of this uh, money here to, and for economic development purposes, purposes but also to uh, make Minnesota you know, the kind of a beacon across the nation and lead lead in this space. Our focus is on agriculture, bring technology to farmers and farm cooperatives and businesses, but there are much broader implications for the region. And so it's good to uh, share information across these industries. Um, farmer owned cooperatives could utilize renewable hydrogen for production of ammonia, urea, methanol, sustainable aviation fuel, and other molecules. So this would be another opportunity for farmers to vertically integrate, but also expand into potential ownership of, of, of these production systems similar to you know, the ethanol model. Green nitrogen fertilizer is transformative is a gateway for other green hydrogen energy applications within the Midwest. So with that, I, I started with this uh, stained glass window pane, uh, kind of a vision for what our future could look like. And then at the bottom point pane, I just want to say that we're, we're seeing that vision and we're heading in that direction. Our, one of our friends, uh, Senator Senjum, has, has said that, see the future go there. And I think we're well on our way to uh, leading in that space. And as I like to say, for the West Central Research and Outreach Center, we are leading innovation in the agriculture and beyond. So that, here's my contact information. I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. How fast do you think this is gonna come online? Are we talking decades and are the ammonia suppliers, are they on board with this? Yeah, the well, the ammonia suppliers are, they're, first of all, they're, there's four, basically, four large ones in the United States. Uh, that's one of the problems, too, is, is trying to uh, get more sources for the nitrogen fertilizer. But they, they are working in this area. You mentioned greenwashing. To some extent, they are, they are doing that to some extent. You know, uh, I'll give you an example. I won't, I won't name the company, but there's a company that has a large ammonia production facility in Louisiana. Very large. They produce million, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons, millions of tons of ammonia every year. They're putting in a 10 megawatts uh, electrolyzer to produce green green ammonia. You know, so that that's a very small percentage of their overall. But at the same time, they see the opportunity with the IRA as well. And there's a project uh, already, 800 megawatt project uh, that's been announced for Spiritwood, North Dakota to produce green ammonia. So it's it's not it's uh, it's not going to take decades. It's going to happen much faster than that. It's going to happen though. It's probably going to take two to three years because one of the challenges is that uh, is the electrolyzer supply. The supply chain is just ramping up. And if you recall back when wind energy first started, we kind of ran through those cycles where uh, wind turbines weren't available because of production tax credits, and then they were available because the production tax credits plunked off, and we kind of did that roller coaster thing and. Um, you know, I think that's one good thing about establishing this uh, IRA production tax credit. It, it's for it's, it's available for ten years, but once you in year twenty thirty one, if you're producing, then you get it for ten years. So once you start producing, if you qualified and made it within that time ten year window, then you get it for ten years. Mm -hmm. By the way, the 
you know, it's not just green ammonia. The, the sustainable aviation fuel is going to happen quickly also. And I think one of the one of the most challenging ones might be the green green iron and green steel, because uh, you can make you can make nitrogen fertilizer in this case at a fairly small scale, and I'm talking cooperative or county county wide or three county wide. You can you can do that. You know, it takes a little bit larger sales scale for sustainable aviation fuel, but you can have uh, several ethanol plants, for example, feeding one sustainable aviation fuel plant, but Green steel, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's a huge investment. Thank you, Michael. This is uh, fascinating. Um, I appreciate what you're doing by uh, full disclosure. I'm a graduate of the University of Minnesota in chemical engineering Great. a thousand years ago. I'm now older than dirt, but it's nice to see the use of renewable energy to create molecules. Yep. <laughs> and... <clears throat> Um, but I was, I was listening to a podcast the other day and it, when we talk about using, creating ammonia and using it to burn, to do other processes like drying grain and that sort of thing, the, the question that always occurs in my mind is, is there a more direct way to go to using renewables for heat. As an example, in the podcast I was listening to, uh, you mentioned Bill Gates, and he's a sponsor of one of these projects, but it is uh, the use of carbon batteries. You mentioned the price of you know, batteries in the market. Well, carbon battery is like a big brick, and the idea is that you use uh, renewable energy simply to heat that up to 2,000 degrees, and then you can use that energy either in light form and or heat form, heat form for industrial processes, perhaps like drying grains uh, or converting it directly to electrical energy back out through a IR uh, solar panel, so to speak. But anyway, it's something you might take a look at in your kind of overall planning because what I what I hear kind of is I hear the need to replace natural gas and some of the polluting processes, uh, carbon generating processes that we have. But once you have a process set up, then it's kind of well, what else can I use it for? Can I use it as you know to grill my steak? Can I put you know turn it into salt? Whatever it is, and there may be more direct ways to uh, uh, and more efficient ways from an energy mass conservation yep. no it's a good point it? yeah never never count out technology because you don't you know we who would have thought that we would have, you can't see it who would have thought that we'd have uh smartphones you know that that was that was on star trek that was you know, we didn't think we were going to have phones that we carried around with us but um i agree that better technology will improve and it'll it'll be better than what it is uh you know i can the nice thing about hydrogen and ammonia, at least ammonia, is that you can move it around. You know, uh, wind is very location dependent. Uh, so we can have wind in just across the border here in South Dakota at two cents a kilowatt hour because they're at a higher capacity factor. And, and we we're, we can produce it for three and a half cents. So then it's a question of, is it more cost effective to produce ammonia in South Dakota, transport it to farms, or is it more cost effective to build a, a wind turbine here in in Morris and then and have a, a battery as you as you said, basically a thermal uh, thermal uh, sink or thermal load? So I I think those are good very good questions. And that's why I, why I look to my uh, colleagues in chemical engineering, material science on the uh, techno economics of this and making sure that we can address those questions. By the way, you you might recall. Lanny Schmidt, he was one of the initial people that uh, helped us get started in this back 20 years ago. And he, we were developing from Lanny Schmidt, and quite frankly, I hated thermodynamics. So, <laughs> yeah. well, and Lanny was he uh, when he first started, he said, "You need to make this pilot plant idiot proof." And I was in the room and I was looking at him. And I said, "Lanny, who are you talking about here?" <laughs> so, <laughs> it was clear that it was going to be uh, myself and another person that would be running it. So, 
So, so, so now we're going down memory lane. I'm sorry, Tim and Jason, but uh, Ken Keller told me that uh, my only hope was if I blew something up early in my career, they wouldn't remember what I did. They just remember I did something. So, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I did have one kind of geography question uh, kind of while you're doing that. It kind of mentioned early on that the creation of the uh, hydrogen or the um, ammonia and the hydrogen um, is kind of geography dependent right now. Kind of we have a you know the, the corn belt and then we have these high consistent winds kind of you know where we live. Yeah. My question is, is there anywhere else on earth that this uh, is seen as well? Have you had any interest in uh, you know, uh, across the pond or anyone else? Oh, yeah. You know, I mentioned the IRA and I was in a, I had a, ammonia green ammonia conference in Hamburg last mm -hmm. December and some people were really upset that the United States had offered such a high incentive for hydrogen but others were saying it's amazing that the United States is going to subsidize subsidize our supply of hydrogen from the U.S. to Europe and so they expect to import ammonia crack it into hydrogen put it in pipelines and transport it around Europe that way but there's there's other places uh Africa produces a lot of, of uh, phosphate fertilizers. Uh, so, and uh, uh, the products are diammonia phosphate and monoammonia phosphate. So they all they they use considerable amount of ammonia there as well. And then the other part of this is that uh, Pacific Southeast Asia they're looking at ammonia for an energy carrier. Uh, Australia and Japan want to work together to to uh, ship ammonia from Australia to Japan. So there's a lot of interest in using ammonia as a fuel. All right, thank you. How can you get farmers involved in this production? Or is it possible? Is it possible to do something like a co-op or franchising or something along those lines? There, well, there, there's already co-ops established. So the 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 cooperatives are owned and governed by the farmers themselves. So one co-op may have 500 members or it could have 3,000 members. And uh, so they, they already purchase the inputs. They purchase nitrogen fertilizer. They handle it. Uh, and this past legislative session, I uh, worked with groups like Minnesota Farmers Union, uh, Fresh Energy, and others to develop a grant program that would give was, there was $7 million in the program. It was the initial request was 70 million, but it ended up at 7 million and it's for cooperatives to uh, apply for grants. And then they could use these grants to invest in uh, nitrogen fertilizer production, green nitrogen fertilizer production facilities. So there's some seed money for them to work on it and, and incentivize it. Well, along uh, sort of in the right uh, arena, are you getting any flack from farmers who see it as putting the corn industry out of business? Do we get flack from farmers from this? Um, yeah, corn farmers. Really, pardon me? Corn, farmers of corn. In other words, uh, ethanol no. can be uh, made synthetically and uh, and eventually... Oh, that, that piece? Yeah. I don't, I don't know that they're they're too concerned yet because the economics aren't very well or aren't very good for that technology. Okay. Uh, as that goes on, maybe maybe they'll be more concerned. You know, we, we, we approach it... Uh, that, you know, the, the consumers are always right. You know, they old say the consumers are always right. And so whether farmers believe in these practices, you know, reducing fossil fuel consumption, uh, decarbonizing the industry, uh, the, the consumers do. And groups like General Mills, uh, Costco, Walmart, Target are listening to the consumers. And then they're, they're saying that, uh, wait a minute, we have to reduce our scope three emissions, which means on farms. And so we're going to have programs to do that. And so we we tell farmers we're developing these tools so that when it's it's needed, you can utilize them. They, they're pretty receptive about that. Well, I'm going to jump in with another question. Uh, you had talked about uh, excess wind capacity, you know, producing more than can be used, and it's getting wasted. And you talked about storing it as ammonia. And then you also talked about maybe using fuel cells to convert it back to electricity. And I'm wondering how efficient that process is. Do you do it as better than batteries or where are you at with that? Well, first of all, I would contend that it's not, you know, efficiency, 
battery people always talk about efficiency. They don't talk about the economics. And I think, first of all, it's the question is, is it more economical? The answer is yes, in our, in our modeling. The question about efficiency, you are correct that batteries uh, can be more efficient in round trip energy. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it's really, to some extent, comparing apples and oranges. You know, cheaper is better. <laughs> cheaper is better. Uh, flexibility is better. So, you know, batteries have, they can, they have multiple uses on a, on electric grid. You know, they can respond quickly. You can store, you know, you can have ancillary services, but you can't move batteries very well. And you can't use it for other purposes like thermal energy very easily or, uh, you know, producing chemicals, other biofuels or e-fuels or using it for nitrogen fertilizer. So that's where hydrogen and ammonia have some advantages. I think they're going to be, it's all, they're all going to be part of the solution, but I think hydrogen and ammonia have some unique uh, capabilities and advantages there too. Thanks again. Yep. Round of applause. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Mm. Have a good night, everyone. Uh, be sure to join us uh, Thursday, November 9th, when we will hear from Robert Ed of Darcy Solutions. Uh, we'll be talking decarbonizing buildings and the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, by the way, Darcy produces aquifer-based geothermal heat pumps, so that's a little different. Uh, so be sure to join us then. Uh, otherwise, on behalf of the leadership team here at the Central Minnesota Chapter of the Climate Reality Project, thank you for attending. Mm -hmm.